Bienvenidos a Adrián en Complicidad Show en nuestro especial de Latinos Sobresalientes, en donde conoceremos a Francisco Sánchez, quien es justo coordinador adjunto de la Oficina de Seguridad Nacional y de Emergencias del Condado de Harris. Con él, justo, comenzamos. Este segmento es traído a ti por Goya Foods, porque si es Goya, tiene que ser bueno. Y hoy en Latinos Sobresalientes le damos la bienvenida a Francisco Sánchez, quien es coordinador adjunto de la Oficina de Seguridad Nacional y Manejo de Emergencias del Condado de Harris. Un latino sobresaliente del cual hoy conoceremos su historia. Bienvenido. Bueno, gracias por la invitación. Uh, es, todo el tiempo es un privilegio a, a hablar con nuestra comunidad y específicamente con usted. Es, es, el, es el mes de herencia hispana. Uh, estás muy involucrada en la comunidad y campeón de la comunidad. Uh, gracias por tenernos. Muchísimas gracias, Francisco. Y nosotros queremos saber y conocer quiénes en verdad eh, nos están representando, que eso nos llena muchísimo de orgullo, que más latinos de la primera, segunda o tercera generación de latinos están en cargos eh, públicos. Eh, Tell me a little bit about your story, uh, about you, you, your parents. Sure. Where are they uh, from? My dad is from Mexico, uh, so I'm first generation. He's from San Luis Potosí. Uh, my, he, uh, my mom is from South Texas, second generation uh, uh, Hispanic family from there. So I'm first or, sec or third generation, depending how you look like it. But they were migrant farm workers. So they met on the fields picking crops uh, between Texas, Florida, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. And they would just travel the country uh, uh, picking crops. They had me. Um, when I turned three and my sister was born, uh, they decided it was something, uh, they needed something a little more stable um, to give their, their kids a, a better chance. Uh, so my dad came here to Houston during the oil boom, uh, decided to become a welder. Um, so he worked along 225 and all that petrochemical and oil industry, helping build those facilities. Um, and it is a really great for all the things that I think I'm proud of in, in my life is probably being the son of migrant farm workers, uh, folks that put food on the table for this country. Um, and we saw particularly during the pandemic how important that is. Um, and so really proud of that heritage, uh, all the hard work that really goes into that. Uh, and so me, that's probably the most uh, important thing in my life in terms of who I am. Uh, that would probably be the thing that, that, that matters most to me because really they picked crops to give me the chance to pick my own destiny. Um, and so really grateful for that and that upbringing. And that was in the beginning of the Latino community here in the United States, yeah. yes. How difficult was it, and uh, because you have the both cultures mm -hmm. in North America and Mexican, because for sure, for sure, you had tamales and a very Latino Mexican <laughs> education. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has been an interesting upbringing. Um, es por, es por que, que sé en, de, 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 de parientes latinos que vinieron a Houston para darme mejor oportunidad. Uh, por eso hablo mejor inglés que español. Uh, querían que aprendiera inglés primero. Uh, y en muchos en muchas casos eh, me ha servido bien eh, de, 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 de hablar inglés uh, 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 bien y, 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 y todo eso, pero um, la falta de poder hablar español como me gusta eh, es algo que, 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 que era... Uh, uh, también pasó con dando esa oportunidad. So the opportunity to, for, for me, uh, raised in those two cultures, um, first and foremost, they wanted to give us an opportunity. So uh, they really were strict about Francisco's going to speak Spanish, he's going to study, I mean, he's going to speak English, he's going to learn that language first. Um, and so that's when I, when, when, when I tend to do my interviews in, in, in Spanish, I'm a little concerned about that because it's very Tex-Mex Spanish. <laughs> uh, but I call it Texican. <laughs> Texican, I like that. But, but, but I did not lose on the great Mexican food. <laughs> We've learned to combine that with great Texas <laughs> and American food. And so uh, that part of my life definitely did not suffer. So. 
Digo, al final del día esto enriquece más nuestra cultura, porque y también en, esa, en, en ese entonces, eh, at the school they don't want you to speak Spanish, they force you to speak only English, and was not, uh, the, the teachers don't allow you to uh, speak Spanish. Now the story is different. I don't know how people complain right now because today is much different. But at that time, uh, when you uh, was a child, and you, you, you tell me about how difficult it was like uh, be at the school uh, speaking English, back to home, and have a different uh, traditions and different uh, education than your friends. It, it was very different. It was it, it was it was living basically living in two different cultures that were coexisting at the same time, and you almost had to separate those out. And I often find, uh, growing up, that I would have to be um, Hispanic Francisco at home, and then sort of you know American-born Francisco at school. Um, and I hope that's changed a little bit. There has been a, a shift in education in terms of appreciating languages, particularly Spanish here. Um, so you have, uh, aside from just Hispanic culture, you've got the Arabic immersion school here. Mm -hmm. You've got a great reward, uh, great resources in this community if you want to experience different cultures. And so times have changed, and so that's a big plus. Um, but there were certainly some challenges uh, in how those two worlds came together when I was growing up. Uh, like I said, my mom and my dad were very, um, very adamant that I needed to learn English, write English, speak English well, uh, and that I needed to do very well in my studies. They, my mom got a GED, my dad didn't go more than elementary school, the first person in my family to graduate high school, the first one to go to college, definitely the first one to get a master's degree. Um, but uh, as, and I think I did okay in school, but even then there were some barriers. I remember if it hadn't been for my mom, I probably would have had a very different educational opportunity and I probably wouldn't be in the position I'm at today. Um, it was, I think, a, a, in fifth or sixth grade um, that for some reason they wanted to put me in English as a second language. Um, and so they would have taught, so, and so the way the school system works, I would have lost a lot of opportunities to not focus on other topics. They would have put me in English as a second language, which means I would have been taught in Spanish, lessons in Spanish, uh, trying to improve my English when my English was already good. Um, and so I would have lost the opportunity to, because I knew English, I, I could do better at science if I was being told English, if I could do better at math if I was being taught in English. But they were trying to funnel me into that program just because my name is Francisco Sanchez. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was quiet, I didn't speak a lot. Um, and so if my mother went to the school, <laughs> she didn't take no for an answer. Uh, she was not happy with what the teacher said, so she marched down the hall, talked to the principal, <laughs> and, and, and fixed that. So, um, and one year later, I was in honors English. Wow. Uh, and so that's one of those things where uh, I'll, I'll tell parents, you've got to fight for your kids. Uh, when it comes to those cultural issues, um, this is our school system, this is our community, we're a part of this. Um, uh, we can't be allowed to define you know, who we are, we define that ourselves. Um, and so that's, uh, if my mom hadn't done that, it probably would have been an entirely different story. So I always look back at my education um, at those kind of defining moments in, in terms of uh, what could have really put my path in a totally different direction if my mom hadn't stepped in, it probably would have been a different world. How was your childhood uh, at home with your family? What is the, the best uh, remembers you have about it? Yeah, so uh, I have memories that are, I mean, I loved it. It's just that uh, my, my mom uh, uh, worked part time. My dad was a welder, so he came in the evenings. We had a lot of cousins. My mom had nine brothers and sisters. My dad has 10. Uh, so it, it was just me and my sister. Uh, so always cousins over. We would always be going some weekends to barbecue somewhere at the park or to have barbacoa or just, you know, carne asada. We would just, it, was, it was always fun. Carne asada. And then every time I, <laughs> and then um, because my parents uh, stopped being migrant farm workers, my aunts and uncles were still, and so was my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, so every time they were coming, passing back through Texas, they had roots in South Texas where they had, they had rancho in Bronzeville, but when it was time to pick crops, they would go back and, and start that loop over again, and so they would stop in. So I was always exposed exposed to that. So um, it was nice. Uh, like I said, the food was amazing. The, the the family of the culture was there. The food was there. The music was there. Um, I always joke, no matter where I've gone in my life, uh, I joke that I've disappointed my mom because she wanted me. She wanted me to grow up to be a mariachi. <laughs> no, really? She wanted me to grow up a mariachi, uh, and and I, I remember I. I, I 
Yeah, I think I was at the uh, when I was getting the uh, public official of the award, public official of the year award from the University of Houston. I made sure to invite my mom, and so she was there. Um, and I started with that joke that you know I appreciate this award and this honor, but I've disappointed my mom. <laughs> she wanted me to be mariachi. I can't dance. <laughs> I can't sing, and the only instrument I've ever played is a saxophone. So, oh but, lord! But, but and my mom, my mom of course loves me. She's very proud of me. But I always joke that. You, but we go out to eat mariachi. You see, mm -hmm. you see some mariachi. Oh, they're going to spend at least an hour at our table. Even <laughs> even in a family reunions, you don't sing so, with mariachi. Uh, uh, I, I will after after some good food after after, <laughs> I've, uh, after I've drank. A few things that are not water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, we don't, don't want to hear what. Sing, but exactly. I, will do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And uh, how many? How many uh, um, sister and brothers you have? I have one younger sister. She's three years younger than me. Okay. Um, and so, luckily, um, because my mom and dad have big families, they're anywhere from Mexico to Ohio to Florida, they're God. everywhere. <laughs> but we've got a family of four: my mom, and dad, uh, me, and my sister, and we've all stuck here in Houston since we settled down. Uh, all on the southeast side. Uh, my dad's in Pasadena, my sister's in Deer Park, my mom is in South Houston on the same property we grew up on. Um, and I'm the only one that moved to the big city here in Houston. So uh, it's all one small place, but they, they, they don't like coming inside the loop. So. Well, can you see the memories come now, like a, pre a, a, a real present life? <laughs> That's good when you have this kind of conversation. And, and ahora ustedes pueden conocer un poco más de Justo de Francisco Sánchez, quien hoy nos está representando y nos cuida tanto en los momentos que más lo necesitamos, como son los momentos en donde la madre naturaleza viene a sorprendernos. Pero, ¿cómo llega aquí a Houston? ¿Por qué llega a Houston? ¿Y cómo comienza su carrera profesional? Eso lo vamos a descubrir a continuación en Latinos Sobresalientes a través de isemiriatv.com. Ya regresamos. Y cuando nos quedamos en casita, hay que cocinarle a toda la familia. Y miren las delicias que hacemos cuando nos quedamos en casa con los productos Goya. ¡Mmm! ¡Qué sabroso! Obviamente, Goya no puede faltar. Y vean, ¡uy! Oh, hasta pancito con mantequilla y todo para consentir a mi familia. ¡Ay, qué rico cocino! ¿Seré yo o la abuela? ¡Ay, bueno! Shh, es la abuela, pero no digan nada. Lo que sí es cierto es que en esta casa utilizamos diariamente nuestros productos Goya, porque si es Goya, tiene que ser bueno. Ay, a veces cómo nos cuesta vernos en el espejo a las mujeres y reconocer ay, nuestras debilidades, pero es allí, aquí entre nos, porque las mujeres no tenemos debilidades. Lo único que sí, tampoco puedo decir que tengamos defectos, pero a veces tenemos carencia de algunas cosas. Por ejemplo, en mi caso, yo no tengo color en, en, en mis cejas. Si yo no tuviera la doña Beauty en spa, no hay color. Es más, no se lo digan a nadie, pero aquí está el antes, el durante y el después. Gracias a la doña Beauty en spa con el micro blending, que bueno, por pandemia yo no podía hacer este tratamiento, pero pues, me hicieron ahora y estoy feliz. Cuando fui a la playa sufría porque, híjole, sin color y el maquillaje, pues aunque te lo pintes las cejas, se te va el color. Entonces, sí, naturalmente y orgánicamente la doña Beauty en spa hace el micro blending, pero también te puedes poner extensiones de pestañas, te pueden cambiar el color del cabello, peinarte si es tu cumpleaños graduación, divorcio o lo que tú quieras todo en la doña Beauty en Spa, quien está estrenando una nueva locación y que te pido que me la apoyes porque entre nosotros tenemos que apoyarnos al pequeño mediano negocio así que a darle y allá los espero con la doña Beauty en Spa Cada 60 segundos, no uno sino dos niños son víctimas de la trata y cada 30 segundos uno se ve obligado a explotar Today we launch Goya Cares. Goya Cares está comprometido a apoyar a víctimas y vencedores de tráfico y abuso. Para recuperar, restaurar, volver a conectar y para hacer brillar la luz que bloqueará el tráfico. Y visite blocktraffic.org. Houston, prepárate a recibir la puerta de entrada a tu inversión en la Unión Americana. Puerta Verde. Puerta Verde es un desarrollo inmobiliario diseñado para albergar a 52 productores de frutas, verduras y secos en un layout moderno y bajo las más altas tecnologías. 
por un lado se beneficia el productor al monetarizar el 100% de su producción y por otro lado el consumidor se beneficia al tener todo el abanico de oportunidades para adquirir productos de la mejor calidad. Nuestro proyecto radica en tener dos centros de distribución en Houston, uno en Dallas, uno en San Antonio, uno en Austin. Puerta Verde es la respuesta de los productores mexicanos al nuevo entorno económico al nuevo, y al nuevo Tratado de Libre Comercio. Llega a Houston, Puerta Verde. Espérala próximamente. Este segmento es traído a ti por Puerta Verde. Regresamos con nuestra conversación con Francisco Sánchez, quien es actualmente coordinador adjunto de la Oficina de Seguridad Nacional y de Emergencias del Condado de Harris. Pero cuando tenemos un latino que ha sobresalido, que nos está representando, que conoce nuestra cultura, que conoce nuestras raíces y saber que está en un lugar importante para podernos asistir en el momento que lo necesitamos, nos llena también de muchísimo orgullo. Es por ello que hoy queremos saber un poco más de su historia, de, de, de su niñez, de su preparación. El presente muchos lo conocerán, su pasado pocos, pero hoy sabremos más de lo que detrás de bambalinas se vive teniendo un cargo como este. Y bueno, Francisco, eh, llegas a Houston. How you move or why you move to Houston? Uh, Houston was where the opportunity was. I, we went to, I grew up in South Houston. My, my parents came here to give us better opportunity when they were farm workers. Um, and I went to the University of Houston. Uh, it's the first time I ever came inside the loop <laughs> uh, by myself. Uh, and, and, and fell in love with the city. It's a, you know, I've had a few opportunities to move, um, but this is home. The community's here, it's, it's very welcoming. For a big city, it has a very small feel. Um, uh, the community's great, the culture's phenomenal, um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity here. And, 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 and the city has done, and this community's done a lot for, for me and my family. It's, it's allowed my, my family to, um, uh, you know, to, have, to, 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 to have better opportunities. Um, I've got nephews here and family and friends here, um, and, and, and it's an opportunity to, to be a part of this thriving community and, and to be able to give back. And you move uh, when you already have a job in here or because you went to the university? Or uh, we grew up in South Houston. Um, and, and, and so once I graduated from university, uh, I decided to stay here. What Utah. university? Uh, university of Houston, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so University of Houston, which, 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 is a, which is a great place. You know, the University of Houston has grown phenomenally over the years. It, it's, 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 it, it, it's a good institution here in Houston. Um, and honestly, I wanted to go to the University of Houston here locally and then go to graduate school somewhere else. But I, uh, um, the community has been so good to me. I, I went to University of Houston. Uh, I had my first real job before I even graduated. Um, I helped. Which one was? Uh, I was the legislative director for state representative Diana Davila, which is you know quite some time ago. I, I wasn't e I was not even old enough to drink, <laughs> and, and 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 she called and said, "Will you be my legislative director?" The job started in 30 days in Austin, so I packed up and left, um, and, and learned a lot, and then did that again the next session. Um, Sorry, why you think she picked you like that? Um, I, I'm very grateful that people, uh, it, you know, in this town, it's, it, it, one of the great things is, is people do a pretty good job of recognizing you for your talent. Um, they don't pay attention so much as your background. You know, have you graduated yet? They look at, uh, there's a lot of folks here in Houston. It, it's an interesting culture here. People will look at you for the opportunity that you, the potential you have uh, and be very nurturing. So I've been very lucky that, that my entire career has been based on people that saw some potential gave me an opportunity, um, and really, I never knew I was supposed to fail. <laughs> I mean, you know, here I, I, hadn't, I hadn't even graduated, uh, uh, was barely studying political science. An, op an opportunity came to become the legislative director for a state representative. I didn't know that I was supposed to fail, so I, 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 I gave it 100%, did well. Um, then that la after the legislature, I went to go work for, for, for a firm that did Hispanic marketing and public affairs, uh, to, and I headed up their, their, their Latino division, again, never done that before, but someone, Hector Carreño, gave me a great opportunity. He saw potential, and I didn't know I was supposed to fail, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it worked out well. Um, and next thing you know, I ended up at the county, same opportunity, so uh, the county judge at the time said, um, you know, come give me a year uh, of service at the county. That was in December 2004, and so uh, uh, 
three years ago was 15 years at the county. I took a picture of my 15 year certificate wow. and I sent it to him and I said, here's my update on my one year at the county is going. <laughs> so it's a, I, I, I've been there much longer than I, than I expected, but, uh, but this is a great community. What is the, the, the more uh, difficult challenge uh, you already have for all these uh, 15 years um, on the county? I, I guess in the county, uh, the, the, the very nature of what we do, dealing with emergencies, uh, is probably, uh, uh, there's a, there have been a lot of challenging opportunities. And, and, and I've been really attracted to being able to be of service to our community at its most difficult times. Um, I, even, I was not supposed to do emergency management for the county. That's not how it started. Um, how it started? So it started, it was, I, I started in December 2004. Mm -hmm. And eight months later, uh, the county was opening up the Astrodome for Hurricane Katrina. We were welcoming all these evacuees. That was your welcome that into was, the that county. Uh, we opened up the Astrodome for the next three weeks. The county Remember. judge says, fix this, handle that, take care of that. And next thing you know, I was doing emergency management. And, and, um, and at the end of it, he asked me, Are, do, you, do you like this? And I said, I'm enjoying it. And, and, and he said, why? I said, you know, to see those people come from New Orleans um, and Louisiana and Mississippi, had lost everything. Um, the evacuation could have been better. The response could have been better. And to move to an entirely different city um, and really have lost everything and not knowing where to start, something in my heart said, you know what? I never want this happening in our community. Um, we need to do better. Um, so I've spent the next 16, 17 years um, working through the Office of Emergency Management, building the organization, changing its culture, and making sure that we're ready for whatever kind of disasters we need to face. Um, and now fast forward all this time now, and I've been now in command staff for four of our nation's 10 most costly natural disasters, uh, and now a pandemic. So um, uh, we've gone from hurricanes to pandemics, to tropical storms, ice storms, floods, wildfires, a Super Bowl, two World Series, hopefully three World Series now. <laughs> Uh, hope, 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 three, three hope. World Series before the Come tomorrow. on, Astros, go, go. <laughs> so that's been my time at the county. Well, this is, it sounds like a, sounds really, okay, yeah, cool, it, easy. No, it is not, <laughs> because each a, event have the, the, the special risk, the special demand, and uh, why do you think, uh, or what exactly we are learning for each event? Why now we can say, Houston is better, and the authorities are better right now, protect you in the better way. And that's a, and that's a great question. Each unique, each event is uniquely different. Um, and um, I will stay in this position as long as I can say this. If I should be able to tell you every day we are better prepared today than we were yesterday. The day that I cannot say that is the time for me to move along or let someone else take this position. Um, because we need to learn from everything every day to do better. Disasters are getting bigger. They're happening more often. They're more catastrophic. They're impacting the same vulnerable communities over and over uh, from Ike and Harvey, all the floods after Harvey, the pandemic and the ice storm. You see vulnerable communities being impacted over and over. Um, and so there's a new challenge every day. And so, you know, I, I'm very, you know, every time someone does an introduction or something, they say Francisco has been on command staff for four presidential declared disasters and all of this. Um, and I say, you know, the only expert, I'm only an expert in the disasters that we've gone through. I am not an expert at the next hurricane. I'm not an expert at the next flood. We have to approach this with humility. You can't go facing the next storm or the next disaster thinking you know everything. You have to be humble. Um, you have to rely on a team that knows what they're doing. Um, and you have to keep the community first and foremost in mind. And those are the tough decisions that we have to make day in and day out. Um, so I think, we're, I think the things we're learning um, as a community are how to be better prepared how to be more inclusive from the diverse community that we have to make sure that we've got the resources, the education, the outreach, and the response efforts that are dedicated to, to, to helping them. Um, and I think also um, what I think is intriguing to me lately is we're facing a new era in emergency management. Like I said, our, our disasters are more frequent, they're more catastrophic. Um, you saw someone called me during uh, Harvey and said, this is a once in a lifetime event. Someone called me during the ice storm and said, this is a once in a lifetime event. Someone called me during the pandemic and said, this is a once in a lifetime event. That's three lifetimes, not only 49. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we need to do better at recognizing that disasters are gonna be more frequent and they're gonna be more catastrophic. And we can't just do that our own. Uh, we have to engage the community to make sure they're more prepared, 
they're more resilient, and that's beyond disasters. You know, uh, how, how, how do we have food security? How do we have better transportation? Do people have access to health care? Do people have access to education? All those things don't seem related to emergency management, but if you're struggling as a community member with any of those, you're going to be more vulnerable during a disaster. So from mm -hmm. the emergency management side, we need to challenge our colleagues that work in each of those spaces uh, to step up their game to help us build a more resilient community. What or oh, how the community can be better? Because maybe you, like authorities, learn because you are the ones that face and need to organize and all the logistic and try to keep the community safe. But sometimes us, we only thinking about us and last minute. Uh, we are running to the grocery store, or or we don't we don't listen. Like uh, don't drive today. Will be you know the the the, the top of the uh, of the storm, and we are driving to you know <laughs> and, and go to a bar or something yeah. like that, and put in risk ourselves, but also put in risk our authorities. How we like a community can be better? I think there's three things that people will always tell you: get a kit, make a plan, and stay informed. But I add a fourth thing that's really important, and that's to be involved. Whether you're involved in your PTA, in your civic club, in your church, in your community group, or in your neighborhood, I think an involved community is a better prepared community. Um, and I think uh, we do a pretty good job at, at responding to disasters when we think just beyond us. You know, if you're involved in that, you generally have, involved in your community, you generally have a better sense of, I can't just be doing something for me or not doing something for me. It has implications. Um, and, and so that's critical. And one. We need to face the reality that um, uh, disasters are big things. That you know, uh, uh, we're, we're we're small in this world, and that's, that's by design, right? So uh, we need to have some humility when, when disasters are confronting us. And you know, if we ask you to stay home mm -hmm. for a day, that's not asking a lot. If we ask you to check the forecast before you go somewhere in the morning or not to drive through high water locations, that's not really asking a lot. And, 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 and um, uh, that's the, the best thing people can do is just recognize disasters are a part of this community. We have an average presidentially declared disaster here on an average of every nine months. Um, this, this is Houston. This, this, this is where we are. Uh, we have everything <laughs> in here, including the eyes, <laughs> hurricanes, so, so the just, winter, just the storms. Yeah. <laughs> it's just take them seriously and listen to your officials. And and, and, and if you're not going to listen to your officials, uh, listen to community voices that are going to be telling you, you know, what to do, and and, and, and just follow those instructions, and we'll, we'll all be better off. But I remember at the time I covered, you know, the, the the weather and all the time I need to be at the studio when uh, the hurricane came, and I was so worried, so worried about my family, about my, about my daughter. She was really small at the time, and how would you manage that? Because you completely stay during, before, during, and yeah. after. <laughs> For for long time, you don't live in the living the, the 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 emergency center, and how, how you disconnect that your personal worries to connect only the community worries. I'm worried for the community. In can your family can say, "Hey, you don't love us," <laughs> you know? <laughs> is Mama is it, not say that? <laughs> she does not say that, but but, but, it, but it, is, it is a very difficult situation to be in, not only for me but for an entire team and everybody that we bring into our emergency operations center, because once we're in that room and once we're dealing with that emergency, um, it's a harsh thing to say, but we can't be focusing on our friends and our family. We've got a community to think about, um, and so every time we say stay home or shelter in place or evacuate or do any of these things, you should really heed those warnings because it's the same thing we're telling our friends and our family. And if we're telling that to our friends and our family, we're telling you, that'll tell you it's, it's, to take it seriously. But for us, it's hard. One of the things that we try to do is make sure if we see a disaster coming, right, hurricanes give us some time, um, is we give our staff time to take care of your family. Make sure your family has what they need. Make sure they've gone to the grocery store. Make sure they're going to shelter in place. And make sure we know how to communicate with them. Um, and, and that generally has worked well. But you know, there's times we're impacted by disasters too. My mom flooded during Hurricane Ike. And I was in the emergency operations center trying to make sure she was OK. Oh, wow. Um, during Harvey, the water came up. Uh, we had to rebuild her home. The water came up to the doorstep. And luckily, she didn't flood during Harvey. But that's a nerve-wracking moment. Um, uh, you know, we've had, uh, during the ice storm, my entire family either lost power or they lost water. 
Um, and so trying to make sure, so, so we take that very seriously. We try to make sure our families are prepared uh, before a disaster um, so that when we go in to the command center that we can be very focused on, on what's important to the community and making not decisions that benefit us or our family but benefit the community uh, on, the, on the greater scale. And I will tell you, the more you do your job and be prepared, the more focused we can be on helping those people that really need help and didn't have the opportunity to prepare or actually being impacted because they're vulnerable in our community. This is something you learn during the time you are working and uh, you are active in this uh, in this position because it's not something is about the skill re skills request during the time you apply for a job or during the time they say uh, 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 what exactly you need to uh, accomplish in, during the, the time you work. Uh, in some moment you think or you thought like, uh, okay, I need to quit the job. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> it's a lot of stress. And also I don't feel I really protect my family or something like that. Yeah, no, I'll tell you, there, 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 uh, there are a couple of times where I said, okay, this is, I'm done. Uh, I, can, I only have one more big disaster left in here <laughs> and I'm done. Uh, and, 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 and was in 2017, <laughs> and after that, and now that happened. And, you know, the thing that keeps it going really is just the, the opportunity to have an impact. And you talked about, you talked about um, having Latinos at the table with those decisions yes. being made. And the thing that has, uh, as, as much as we responded to disasters, you know, we're tired. Our team is tired. This has been a rough few years. We've had Harvey, we've had floods, we've had a pandemic. Uh, we've had this ice storm and they're all back to back and they take not only during those times of disaster but they take away time from our family between the year between all of those to, to recover to prepare to plan um, the, the thing that, that, that I think keeps me going lately um, is especially after the past five years what we've seen in national politics and out of the previous presidency is the importance of having people that look like us talk like us and have our experiences at the table making those decisions um, and I think for our community to be able to trust government, for our community to be able to thrive, you need people at the table that bring those experiences and are willing to speak up for those interests. Um, you know, that's very national right now in terms of, of I, I think we need to see that shift. Um, and I think people that are qualified, people that are committed, people that are Latino or have a, her a heritage that has not been represented at the table, need to step up and they need to give uh, of their time, of their talent, uh, to serve in places uh, where the community can see that there's a voice at the table that looks like them, speaks like them, and understands them. And beyond that, to make sure that when you're at that table, uh, that, that, that you're that voice and you're speaking up. Because if you're not going to do it, who is? That is the reason why it's so important. We need to vote, okay, when we have the opportunity to do it. Because you, we are selecting our authorities. And also, it's not only because they speak Spanish, it's because you can see is how the work uh, they are doing are, are correctly. That's or no. You know, because can be. Uh, the, the number is, uh, what a Latino need right now to one day reach the, the kind of position you have right now or be in the, the leaders, uh, in the political leaders' uh, life? You know, I, I think there's oftentimes um, is one just uh, 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 obvi you know, obviously focus on education, but have a willingness to serve. Um, and, and the humility to serve where you're needed and, and know that it takes some sacrifice. But recognizing, uh, I think you really need to have, if you've got it in your heart to go and serve and, and, and to be a voice for this community, is to go at it 100%. Um, get your foot in the door where you can, prove yourself, and, and there's great opportunities to, to, to move up. Um, and we're in a changing world. Um, you know, I think uh, 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 you look at the demographics of this city. Um, uh, How about the census? The census. Oh, Lord. It is, uh, uh, you know, it, it will not The statistics long. are amazing. It is. Uh, this is a minority, minority community, majority, minority community. Um, and, and if you want leadership to, to, to look uh, like this community does, like you need to be involved, you need to vote, you need to be involved civically, you need to go make your voice heard at City Hall, at City Hall, at county, state and federal levels. Um, and, you, and you need to be committed to that. So, you know, if you've got a willingness to serve, is understanding that that that, that, that there are opportunities there, um, that that you've got to, uh, you know, uh, it's taken me, man. So, uh, 49 now. So it's taken me a while to, to get to our map. But, but, but you know, making career public service is, is a noble profession, um, and, and and so recognizing that that the opportunities there. And, 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 and being able to sort of honor your community and your heritage to doing that is, is very rewarding. So, you know, if you've got it in your heart to do it, you know, go for it. How make you happy? 
You know, um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, this has been a very strenuous job, uh, but during COVID, probably since the most stressful time in, in, in my career, um, I learned a better work-life balance um, in terms of spending time with family, probably because the magnitude of the pandemic, sort of, you know, uh, I think it was a new experience for all of us. So um, traveling, spending time with family, quality time with folks that I care about, you know, um, I, I've made a lot of time for that. Um, uh, more than I typically have over the past year and a half, and I've enjoyed it. I just went to New Mexico, uh, had a great time connecting with, 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 with the culture there, um, and just recharging. And I've, and I've come to the conclusion that, that, that if I want to take care of other people, I have to take care of myself as well. So um, great food, great family time, uh, spending a lot of time outdoors. Uh, the weather's getting better, so <laughs> so it's a little more tolerable now. So, yeah. Well, yes, it's, it's, but we are still in the hurricane season yeah. until November 30th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So, and then, uh, December 1st, what do you think? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you release to, or no? <laughs> no? So I used to think that. Uh, but you talk about the lessons that you learned in your job is hurricane season ends December 1st, but you can still have floods in December. You still have ice storms. And so <laughs> I, I, uh, the other thing I've learned Gosh. is also, I'm probably always the most paranoid person in the room. <laughs> I'm always thinking about, I'm always thinking about the worst case scenario. Uh, you know, I remember a few years ago when they made Hobby Airport an international airport. We had, you know, we had Bush was international, Hobby mm -hmm. was very domestic. And I remember uh, Anise Parker, the mayor at the time, was kicking off the announcement, making that an international airport. And I'm just sitting in the back of the room, and so she comes to me afterwards, Francisco, why aren't you smiling? You, you, look very, you look very serious. And because the paranoid person in me is like, well, now I've got two airports to worry about because the next pandemic is just a plane right away. <laughs> and so she just shook her head and walked off. Uh, but, you know, I, um, you know I, I'm, uh, because I've been at this for a while, I, it's like uh, any time it's the end of hurricane season or the end of winter, I, I certainly am, am very grateful that we dodged a hurricane, but I'm always paranoid about the next one coming. But, but that's my job. That's your job. And you need to always think about the worst case scenario. Like that's, that's part for the be ready, be, be, be prepared. Yeah. Yes. And at, what is, in, in, at this point, um, in, how do you see yourself in five years? What do you want to do? Do you, do you want to continue doing the, the, what you are doing right now? Um, you know, it's funny. About two years ago, someone asked me what, what would make me happy. Uh, and, and without even thinking about it, I said things that make us, I want to focus on recovery, I want to focus on resilience and building communities. And so um, I, I don't know what my next step is. I, I will tell you it's probably uh, whatever it's going to be. Uh, it's either going to be here or moving on to something that's public service, uh, whether it is in government or nonprofit or in business. I, I, I really, um, you know, I have I've spent the vast I've spent now the majority of my professional life responding to disasters, um, and part of me is like I'm done with it. <laughs> you know, I love doing it. Uh, in the moment, I love responding and I love doing the emergency management piece. But we're doing that so much. Um, whether it is in this capacity or somewhere else, uh, my future is definitely in. Um, taking a little bit step back from emergency management and focusing on how do we build resilient communities? How do we tackle things like food insecurity, transportation, health care, um, the economy? All of those things make people, if they're not secure in those things, when they're confronted with a disaster, it impacts them even more. Uh, so what can we be doing to make communities stronger, more resilient? And those are vulnerable communities that look like us. So the more we can do to build up those communities, the more resilient we're going to be in the future. So where I see my future is, you know, I see the rewards of emergency management today. If we had a hurricane, we could respond, we could recover, and I could see immediately the, the, the outcome of my work. Um, when we're talking about resilience and uh, building stronger communities so we can withstand disasters better, that's probably not the kind of work that I will, I could be doing that work today, but I will probably not be around uh, to see the benefits of that. But honestly, that would make me happy. And you will. That is a great plan for the, the, the consequences we have after the pandemic. Yeah. We, we need to reveal to many areas in our community. Yeah. And it's not only about houses or business, or it's, it's, it's about the, it completely the culture, how everything is, are changing right now. We understand, we know it, it, it's a global world, but right now we really live a global world. Yeah. Diversity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. How do you think the, all these moments change in the positive way our future? Um, I think it changes positively in the future because I hope 
um, that the consequence of the pandemic and all the disasters have, it will have, I hope, a culture change in us willing to invest in the resources we need to prepare for the next disaster. We, we are built on a city uh, that is in a swamp, it is in a hurricane landing zone. But I think if we come, I, I think that I hope we're changing the mindset in terms of the future of understanding this is where we are, this is where we built, this is what's great about it, these are the challenges. And let's be honest about what those challenges are and how we tackle those. We can't be putting those aside anymore. Um, if we want a city that's here in the future that's thriving, then we need to re we need to deal with the fact that this is a we're in a disaster prone community, and we have to invest in that, and we have to accept that as a culture. You said, what well, what can people do? Um, is is accept that. You can live here in Houston and be perfectly fine in a disaster prone community, but you need to accept that. And you need to, what, what are your plans for that? Um, and I think post pandemic, um, I hope that we can prioritize um, as a community uh, what our workforce looks like. You, know, you looked at who was, who was at the grocery stores, who was working those that who is delivering those um, and those are people that look like us that were working at the counter that were that, that were at, that, that, that were serving at those restaurants that were impacted uh, and I hope that as a community we've gone to on the larger scale really accepted and become had a mind shift in terms of what really essential workers look like um, because you take that away on any given day uh, disaster mm -hmm. or not it impacts our community so hopefully a better understanding of um, the diversity of our community not only uh, culturally, but also on the, on the socioeconomic scale, uh, and begin to appreciate that better. I need to ask you, what in Houston need right now, at this point, with everything already, we, we, the, all the effects about the hurricanes, COVID, this pandemic has changed us in, in different ways, but what Houston need? Why always Houston flooding? Is, is the is the fourth largest city in the in the United States? Uh, we have the oil and gas business. We have the medical business, and we see it's not enough yeah. to be r not ready, but to support the full community at the time is a big disaster. Yeah. What we need? Um, I think it's really important to have that culture shift and recognizing we need to come to reckoning with the fact that we're in a disaster-prone community. Um, that every and we need to invest in those mitigation projects, and it's hard. To, those are hard political, economic decisions to make. To say I'm going to invest X millions of dollars into mitigation projects that are going to take years to build, and I'm not going to be around to see the political rewards for it, because um, uh, those are significant investments. The longer we make, the longer we take to make those investments, the more expensive it's going to be in the future to continue to mitigate those. We're going to keep flooding. How do we mitigate that? How do we make sure that there's diversity, equity, inclusion, and in how we put that money? Um, and recognizing some of us are very fortunate in that if we were impacted by a disaster, we would have the financial means to recover. But it doesn't negate the responsibility I've got for neighbors a few blocks down in your north side or east end or across the freeway of Kashmir Gardens, anywhere where people do not have the resources to recover, if they aren't recovering, then we can't continue to say it's not my problem. It is our problem. The quicker we get our community more resilient and to recover, especially folks at the lower end of the socioeconomic stratus, um, that's our obligation. And I think as Houston, as a state, as a country, we have to recognize that that is where we need to focus our resources. Um, if we've got the resources to recover, we've got a responsibility to make sure the rest of our community uh, can recover quickly as well and be more resilient. What is your vision about uh, Houston in the next years? And I don't want to say one year because we never know with this <laughs> pandemic when they will be gone. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> Before we say, oh, yeah, in two years, in one year. Well, no, now we're on three months, we say three months, six months, yeah. Yeah, next year. And now we don't know. <laughs> well, I don't mean to sound this. I don't I don't mean to sound pessimistic uh, when I say this, uh, but I hope we can get to in a few years the not looking at you know I think right now we still look at disasters as inconvenient and and why is it happening uh, if we if we can get change the mindset of disasters are a part of life because this is where we are we can't change that we built Houston on swamp we can't change that we built Houston on the Texas Gulf Coast where hurricanes land um, I think we need to do uh, but we do need to make a Here's, I think, my personal wish in terms of what we do better is it doesn't really matter what we do. The reality is, as government, 
um, individually, we have to make a commitment that this community we share, this planet that we share, um, and that we have to start behaving like it and as good stewards. How do we eat sustainably? How do we travel sustainably? How do we move to mass transit? How do we consume or not consume better? Um, all of those little things uh, from how we eat to how we travel to how we live to how we consume or not consume things um, are small things that we can each do that we will not ever see the impacts of, but, um, but uh, we can build all these mitigation projects in the short term, but the long term solution is recognizing where we are in this world uh, as individuals and our individual contributions to making sure that we have a sustainable place to live. And, hundred years from now. I'm not going to be here, but it's my obligation to live that way. Well, well wherever you're going, I will vote for you because it really <laughs> sounds a great plan. And we need that. We need to plan ahead. <laughs> it's, la verdad, fascinante platicar contigo. Además, conocimos detrás de bambalinas, de, de bambalinas lo que sucede en ese centro de emergencias de, del condado de Harris que tanto, tanto nos ha ayudado a prepararnos. Eh, ¿Algo más que quisieras agregar? ¿Something else you want to share with the, uh, our audience before we close the program? Because I don't want to close this conversation, <laughs> really. Well, uh, you, will well, miss, <laughs> you will miss in the, the other part. <laughs> we'll have a happy hour discussion. Yeah, before. exactly. Uh, no, thank you for the opportunity. I will say, uh, you know, there's three things you need to do to be prepared for disaster. Get a kit, make a plan, stay informed, but fourth, really be involved. Get involved in your community, whether it's your church, your civic club, your school, somewhere, because an involved community is a prepared community. Not only because you respond within that group, but I think the more involved that we are, and I hope especially after COVID, and not that we're at the end of it yet, but I hope people will start recognizing the value of community. And the more you feel tied into that community, the more personal responsibility I think you feel uh, to be able to behave in a way that's just beyond looking at ourselves. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are a real, a real, real Latino sobresaliente. Thank you to represent us in the way you represent. Nosotros no nos despedimos. Nos vemos en la siguiente emisión de Adriana en Complicidad Show. Gracias a Francisco Sánchez, nuestro Latino sobresaliente, por haber estado con nosotros.